Welcome to episode 247 of the Formula One Grid Top podcast. Today, we're here to discuss and review all of the action, maybe not all of it, from the 2022 Formula One season. My name is Ruby Price, and back in Imola, I said that if Mercedes won a race this season, I would host a podcast in my underwear. At the time, one Mercedes finished 42 seconds behind the winner, and the other was over a lap down. Seven months later, George Russell wins in Brazil, and I am a woman of my word, and that is why you shouldn't make bets, kids. Anyway, joining me today, we have Grid Talk's very own Owain Medford. Hello. Tom Downey. Hello. And Aaron Harper of the Five Red Lights podcast. Hello. Hello. First, if you enjoy this podcast, we'd love it if you could take five to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or a five-star review in Apple Podcasts. If you do, you'll automatically go into our monthly draw to win a Grid Talk t-shirt from our champion range of merch. And if you're one of the 69% of people who aren't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider helping us out with a like and a subscribe. So, everyone, I think we can all sort of agree Formula One over-promised and under-delivered for for the 2022 season. We had this new concept of car, which was supposed to promote closer racing, better racing. And we did get that for a bit, like sort of bookending the season. But that middle section, there was only one name on everyone's lips, and that was Max Verstappen crosses the line to win the insert race here, no matter where he started. Um but, you know, we did have some memorable moments amongst those, and we're going to discuss those across the show. Um, uh, starting with, let's start with Aaron Harper. So you've said um, Brazil as an element. Um, actually, no, I was meant to start with Tom Danny. But anyway, um, Aaron Harper, um, Brazil, let's, let's start with you. One memorable moment from Brazil. So... I thought the Kevin Magnussen pole position was something that's always going to live in, in people's memories because for me, at least it was the, the mechanics and what it meant to them to have their car on pole position. Yeah, of course it was Magnussen's maiden pole position as well. And that shouldn't be disregarded at all, but those mechanics have worked so hard over these last six to eight years of being in formula one and not always had the reward that they should have had. And that was their moment. And the fact that the car was actually in the garage with the driver sitting in it, you could see how much it meant to them, you could see how much it meant to Kevin Magnussen as well. But the mechanics, we have to remember, yeah, they get to live this wonderful lifestyle of travel and exploration, but they don't actually see a huge amount of the countries they go to visit. And they work long hours, and they have to go back home, and they spend a lot of time away from family. And that can be difficult. So for them to have that moment and that little bit of reward for their efforts, just fantastic. And that, that means so much to them. And it's so easy to associate ourselves with that as, you know, everyday Joes. And, we, you know, we all want that one moment of significance for our efforts. Absolutely. And what it does do is cement, you know, Haas and Kevin Magnussen in those history books with a podium, not a podium, a pole position. Um, you know, we, it was a sprint weekend. Um, so pole position is always, you know, a bit of a weird one. But ultimately, you know, it's there in the records. K-Mag, pole sitter for Brazil. Tom, you've also highlighted Brazil, and I think a lot of people have highlighted Brazil in general, really, because it was just one hell of a fantastic weekend. But come on, give us something. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to sort of slightly copy what Aaron said. Um, I will say to grit of teeth that it was nice to see someone else win. Um, because even, even as a max run, I mean, granted, it had to be Mr. Crikey who would win Sod's Law. Um, but yeah, it, you know, just the whole weekend in general. But those those sort of jubilant scenes we saw on the Friday, um, you know, when, when came across the line and then we had his team, his team radio, where he, where he said, what position are we? And then his engine went, uh, you're P1, mate. And came out was just like, no, he, he, he was basically like, shut the front door. Um, you know, it's just a, uh, it was just it was just amazing and then with the weather closing in and everything it was like as as the sort of countdown clock for quali came further and further down you could see the jubilation in the hash grid sort of like rise and rise and rise 
and then Gunther walking around grinning like a Cheshire cat. That looking came out eyes through his helmet. It's like there's that camera shot of him where he's just he's just absolutely ecstatic. Um, after the sort of torrid couple of years the Hass have had, you know, I'd say like 2019 onward, really, the whole, the whole Rich Energy saga, and then 2020, you know, Grosjean's crash, and then last year, the less said, the better. For them to sort of, you know, they, they started this year pretty well, had a bit of a dip in form, that helped by the Ferrari power unit, chewing itself every five seconds, but then to go and get a pole position against the odds, and also came out being one of three new pole sitters this year as well, in Formula One. Um, yeah, it was just, for, for, for me, it was just, it, it was the kind of thing that it's like, never mind Pierre Gassi like that. It's like everybody like that. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're a Ferrari, a Mercedes, or a Red Bull fan, or whoever. Everybody was happy to see it. Well, maybe not Hulkenberg, um, but everybody was happy to see K Mac on pole. And he did all right in the sprint, to be fair, as well. He, you know, he was never going to hold up the Mercs forever, but he still led a lap or so, then ultimately tumbled down the order a bit. But he's in a has. So yeah, for me, just just seeing him so happy and relaxed, and seeing everybody in the team relaxed and and sort of and sort of like you know, so sort of just just in, just enjoy just enjoying the fruits of their labour, you know. But the mechanics, the engineers, same thing really, I suppose. Um, you know, to however you look at it, you know, strategists, team principals, sponsors. It was Gene Hass's birthday as well. You know, I'm sure I'm sure they said it was his seventieth birthday or something. So, you know. Gunther would have said happy effing birthday, Gene, probably. Gene, we look like rock stars. Aaron, um, you've also mentioned uh, George Russell had a fantastic weekend that weekend. Um, Mr. Crikey, as Tom Downey dubbed him. He did. And just before I talk about George Russell, I wanted to just um, bring up on um, Tom's point about everyone in the paddock enjoying Kevin Magnussen's uh, and Haas's success. Do you remember when Felipe Massa retired for the first time after his crash in 2016, which was in Sao Paulo, and the pit lane was closed, and he got to walk down the pit lane, and everyone was clapping him. It was just a real feel-good moment. It was another one of those, and it, that would just live with everyone forever. forever. But, of course, that, that weekend wasn't just about Kevin Magnussen and Haas being on pole. That was the weekend that George Russell kind of banished those demons of Sakir 2020 and and get got that, that first win. And, of course, it came with the sprint. And it was a really exciting race. He had to work for it. He came through from third on the grid, which he'd kind of secured himself because he'd caused the red flag, which, you know, the, the rules are the rules at the moment. And until they change them, that's the thing that can happen. But he still had to go and do it on the track. And then on the Sunday, not only did he have to uh, lead a race for the whole way, which we knew he could already do, but in the closing stages, he had his teammate and seven-time world champion Lewis Hamilton right behind him and he was trying to get it called off but he knew it wouldn't be because of the radio message to the team and well i, I have a, a theory that lewis didn't challenge george as much as he potentially could have um but nonetheless george did an exemplary job and it was a re real coming of age moment for george at that weekend because he finally got that win and now if the Mercedes is a championship winning car, we know he can win races. So it's it's kind of on between him and Carlos Sainz who gets their next win first. That will tell us where the pair of them are because they were both maiden winners. So for George, it's really, really a, a watershed moment and one that he fully deserved because his season was just fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. A very watershed moment. And Owain, um, George Russell's first podium that, you know, counts because there's no way in any logic that Spa does came in Australia. In a Mercedes, it shouldn't probably have been there. Do you want to say more about this? Yeah. So obviously, you know, Aaron's talking about how it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, how maybe next year George Russell couldn't, if the Mercedes is a championship winning car, let's sort of forget at the start of the season, we were we were astounded at how bad and how, how slow the Mercedes was. Um like it it, it wasn't it wasn't a race winning car, it wasn't a pole winning car. Like it, it the only thing it had going for it was that it looked a bit nice. Um, you know, it was completely astounding that by Australia, 
uh, Mercedes were back on the podium. Um, you know, I, I, and to be honest, I, I, as much I'm going to kind of expand it a little bit because um, you've let me talk. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the the Mercedes was getting podiums far before it ever should have done. Uh, I think it's, it's probably one of the surprises of the season, but I think, it, it, you know, it's memorable for me, if only because it showed... You know, I think there was a lot of people maybe who are like Mercedes can just win from the front and that's it. And they've just got an amazing car. But it clearly shows that, you know what, they can develop a car too and they can get it from the doldrums of, of getting, you know, getting to, to sort of from, from the place where Lewis Hamilton is struggling to get out of Q1 uh, at times and, and taking it all the way to the point of getting podiums and second places and eventually, obviously, that landmark, uh, landmark win. Yeah, absolutely. And as Tom Downey has uh, pointed out, it was a reliable car as well. Um, only, I think, two DNFs across the season, one of which was mechanical. No, three DNFs. One only, I think only one of which was mechanical, and that was in Abu Dhabi um, when Lewis lost hydraulics, I think it was towards the end of the season. But, you know, having a reliable car when, you know, the two teams ahead of you, you know, are DNFing and double DNFing just puts you in that position to capitalize. And that was what Mercedes kind of needed to do in the start of the season when their car just, it was up and down, but it was not up and down in a good way. Um, you know, if that is even a thing, but I'm going to head over to Aaron Silverstone, Ferrari. Sainz got a win, but should he have done? Well, he, he deserved the win because he had driven well. He'd taken pole position in wet conditions. But the Ferrari of old, um, and this this might get a few tongues talking, the Ferrari of old would never have allowed this to happen, especially the Jean Tort, uh Ross Braun era. Leclerc had two victories by this point and still at that point had a shot at the championship. If you'd protected Leclerc, and I know they, they, by the time that they bunched up behind the safety car, Leclerc was absolutely stuffed because it was just a rerun of Abu Dhabi 2021, just with extra laps. So really they, they, they dropped the ball as Ferrari do on strategy, but they, they should have prioritized Leclerc over science because had they allowed Leclerc to win that race, that's an extra 25 point. Well, I say it is 25 points in his pocket, which is more than he got from that. Like he finished fourth. So 13 extra points. And then he wins the next race in Austria. And then I don't think the mistake in Le, uh, Le Castellet happens because Charles was probably pushing a little bit too hard on that period of the race because he knew he needed to win to back up the win in Austria. And he made a mistake. So Ferrari had kind of cornered him there a little bit. Okay, you know, they'd had engine failures. He'd made the mistake in Imola. It's it's shared blame, not solely in, in one direction. But that point was really important because it showed that the team weren't fully behind Leclerc and, and a title push. They were almost happy with just taking a few wins, which for Ferrari, they can never be satisfied with just winning. They should be demand that well, the fans, the Tifosi, demand championships and that the staff need to demand championships of, of themselves as well. You look at how Mercedes have conducted themselves this year as a not win, not championship winning outfit. They still have a championship winning mindset as do Red Bull when they don't win. I don't see that with Ferrari. And that I think was a real poignant moment in the season where the, the, the momentum turned completely from a Ferrari versus Red Bull to it was just Red Bull were going to steamroll the opposition in the second half of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, you've got Carlos Sainz's maiden win as being, you know, a memorable moment of the season. Do you think that, you know, Ferrari made the right decision? Um, well, ultimately, it wasn't their decision. You know, it was Carlos Sainz. But, you know, tell me about Carlos Sainz's maiden win. And do you have anything to say on what Aaron put forward? Yeah, so I'll cover sort of the signs element first. So, so that you know, sort of like his merit. So he he out qualified Leclerc on merit. He you know he started P one. Granted, on the first 
lap. He got absolutely mugged by Max into turn one. You know, Max basically pickpocketed him and, you know, absolutely, absolutely did him. Then also we, we had that horrendous accident with um, with, with Joe Guan Yu. The race restarted. And then Signs was very wise what was going to happen. And he, I feel like we hadn't seen that kind of, that sort of element of Signs before where he was really pushing sort of, like, you, you know, he basically, excuse me, put Max in a position where he's like, I look, matey boy, I ain't just going to roll over and give you P1 like I did the other time. Like, if you want it, you got to come and damn well take it. And I, 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 from that point on, even as a Max fan, I like Signs more because I was like, He's, he seems very nice, very personable, but he's, he showed that he's got a bit of sort of aggression or a, a bit of edge to him, which is needed in F1, especially especially when you're driving for a team like Ferrari, where you don't just have the team and you know that sort of group of fans. You have an entire nation watching you, and then the media pressure that comes with it. So, and that's going to tie in actually to what I'm going to talk about in a moment. So, so, so to see signs hold off, control the race, lead as he needed to. Obviously, safety car came out for, um, uh, I think it was Ocon, whoever it was. And then when Ferrari was was saying to drop back ten car lengths, signs put his foot down and said, "No, it gets, I believe his exact words were stop inventing.' You know, guys, please. Um, you know, which which tells you a lot a lot of what, what you need to know about the sort of inner workings of Ferrari, anyway." And he then held off Leclerc. Granted, Leclerc was on old, I believe, hard tires um, or old mediums. And Leclerc was like, the point is, he was on tires that were fresher and a step softer, if not two steps softer. So it was never really going to be that much of a battle. And he sailed away into the lead for his first win. I still think um, Silverstone this year was one of the races of the season, if not the race of the season. But we'll get on to that at another point. Um, so to see him hold that off and then... The way in which he dealt with the fallout of it afterwards, because I uh, I had a look on the Ferrari Facebook page after um after it, because obviously obviously they put up their, their graphic, you know, signs P one, you know, first maiden win. You know, thought people would be happy for him, but my word, the comments. I know social media is a, is a toxic cesspool of inbreds, um, for want of a better phrase, um, but I stand by that. Um, is and fight me otherwise. Um, the, you know, the um, some of the comments on Ferrari's social media, you know, saying, Well done, you've thrown away the championship, you've thrown away this. Con- congrats on bottling it, you know, you know, just you know, then people saying like signs out, but not so out, all, well, but not so left anyway. Um, you know, all, all, all you know, all basically just, just really, really toxic, you know, just, just horrible. And you know, I say that as a Max fan, um, you know, you know, I know a bit of. Thing or two about toxicity from some of our fans, unfortunately. Um, not that I partake in that. Um, and just the, the way he dealt with it, you know, the, the way he sort of it, it spurred him on because he'd had a really rough start to the season. You know, he, he had a terrible quality in Austria. Um, he was overdriving the car in Imola. It was like he was trying to prove himself. When in actual fact, when he eased off five or ten percent, he was operating at sort of 95 percent efficiency he was getting incredible results and he started to show glimpses of how good he can be um i still think there's more to see and obviously he got another poll later in the season and it also sets him up nicely for the following race in austria before his car turned into a barbecue um mid- midway midway around the circuit um so yeah so so just just his whole sort of like his you know to, to put it on pole is one thing because that ferrari was the goat of quality laps in 2022. You know, Leclerc, you know, what, 10 or so pole positions? And Sainz had two, um, you know, could have, you know, should, should have had some better results than he did. So it's one thing to, one thing to put in a lap, but it's another thing to hold off, you know, you know, like a charging Verstappen and Perez, and then, you know, obviously Max dropped back in the end because he had damage, blah, blah, blah. But then to hold off his teammate, to keep his cool, to control the race, not jump too soon on on the safety car restart line. It was just it was just a really really good weekend for him, and and that's that's why I've put it up there because everything it wasn't just so much like the actual result, but it was the way he got the results, everything he did, everything that went with it. That that's why I've picked it as as one of my moments. Yeah, absolutely. Owen, Monaco. 
not really many happy memories unless you're Sergio Perez, but memorable for many reasons. But just give me a few of them, please. <laughs> well, I'll put it this way. Uh I, I I wasn't watching that race live. Uh, I was watching it uh, after the fact, and I had to skip a full hour uh, <laughs> into into my recording um, to even see, to even see the race. Um, I think this was it's the start of a theme, really, in that it was just it was just insanity to me that we had wet, we have extreme wet tires, and we couldn't go racing with them in a in a in a in a season where. You know, sorry, even at a racetrack that, you know, admittedly it is Monaco, but it has good drainage. Um, it's not, it's, you know, it, it is, it obviously gets quite a lot of surface runoff, but it has good drainage and it, it the, the speeds are so much slower than they are at every other track. Um, and you can see the walls either side of you. It, it should have been, of all the races that started wet, we, we should have been able to go racing there. And Formula One has now got itself into a place where it, it, it cannot do that. And it, it only continued from there um you know it, it, it's it's one of those things that sort of typifies the whole season for me is uh is is the fact that we had to we had to wait so long to go racing at, at a numerous tracks this season but uh, but monaco was the start of it to be honest um that, <laughs> that that's my take on it monaco was the start and, and it only got worse from there to be honest yeah it certainly um it's it carried over across a couple of races across the season um and we will come back to that but tom one driver who had a very good um monaco sergio perez overcutting the ferraris um signs who was trying to dictate his strategy um of you know staying until false licks but unfortunately it just didn't really work out for ferrari but ultimately it worked out for sergio perez yeah heck yeah it did I mean, Ferrari also didn't help by um, by telling their drivers to double stack. Then as Leclerc came into the pit, said, no, stay out. And then we got another great radio clip from, from Leclerc, which I'm not going to play for copyright reasons. Um, but yeah, uh, Perez, this was at a point in the season where I really thought he was going to potentially be in contention for, for the title. How wrong was I? Um let me know in the comments. But um, but uh, it was, yeah, it was just, I mean, Monaco is obviously hard to pass anyway, but it's one of those sort of like jewels in the crown, if, if you know, you know, it's part of the, um, the triple crown or the Holy Trinity or whatever you want to call it, you know, the three musketeers of motorsport, um, where, you know, you know, you know, there's obviously, you know, Indy and um, Le Mans has, you know, alongside it. And, you know, I, I just think for for Perez, given given his sort of whole backstory of everything, you know, losing his drive at the end of twenty twenty, coming in twenty twenty one, and then you know, sort of you know, sort of being like sort of like transported in, into that Red Bull, and you know, still getting a win last year, you know, albeit not you know more by luck than 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 anything you you have to say, thanks to Hamilton's brake magic. Um, but but this year, you know, he. He really started the season on the front foot. You know, you know, he hit pole in Saudi, and then, you know, and then and then was starting at the front in Monaco again. And it was just like, you know, I I thought at that point, it's like, are we actually going to see like a bit of a shift in Red Bull? No, was the answer in the end. Um, but um, but but just just to see him so happy and so jubilant, and and you know, just and then you know, obviously after that weekend that it, that it got announced that he was extending his stay for another two years. Um, yeah, just, you know, I quite like Sergio Perez anyway. I always liked him, um, even when he was at Force India, um, heck, even back in McLaren when he was driving into Jensen. Um, you know, I, no, I, I still quite liked him. And it was just, uh, it, was, it, was just, it was just nice to see. It was, just, it was just nice to see a bit of variety as well at the start, start of the season. You know, we saw, you know, a third third driver winning or you know or a different driver again winning and just you know just 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 for Perez you know, just because he seems like sort of like quite a nice sort of humble like sort of like down to earth dad kind of person you know he just uh it, it just just sort of like warm the cockles a bit um you know as uh, as as, uh, as as some of the old generation would say and yeah it was just it, it was just just nice to see him cross the line and I mean 
okay, we'll take the quality bit out of it because there's still a bit of hoo-ha over that, whether he actually did or not, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's Monaco, you can make a mistake easily enough, but maybe that's the excuse. Who knows? I don't care. Um, the point is, he, he got the win and, and you know, it was, you know the, the race was obviously delayed by an hour, like Owen said, you know, he, he fast-forwarded his recording because it was this and that. And, yeah, it was just, you know, the whole sort of like anticipation of, oh, we're going, no, we're not, oh, we're going, no, we're not. And it's one thing to do that other circuit, but Monaco, where you've got to be so locked in, so focused, so ready to take on the circuit, you know, you know, never mind what's going on behind you. You know, you got you know, the, 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 the Ferrari sniffing like sharks behind your gearbox, just practically going num, 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 because they can taste it, going into Sandoval or something. You know, it's just, oh, God, here we go again. Um, you know, it's just, um, yeah, it was just, it was just, just a good, feel good moment. And I know it's, you know, people might say, oh, well, well done. He, he won a race. It's, yeah, you could say, I get people to say that and people say, you know, Perez is old and blah, blah, blah. Again, I get that. But F1 isn't, isn't a crash, even though it might seem like that at the moment. Um, so, yeah, for, for me, that was right up there this season. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and winning Monaco is a special thing, no matter what the circumstances are. Um, so, you know, Checo will be happy that that has happened. Um, but, you know, we, we started talking about Monaco because there was a bit of a farce going on. Um, Owain, your final memorable moment um, was the farce of Suzuka. Um, you know, we got 40 minutes of a sprint race, basically, at the end of which Max Verstappen was about 30 seconds ahead, um, just to highlight the Red Bull dominance. Um, but ultimately, you know, what, what other than the, the, far, the farce around it, what made Suzuka memorable for you? Um, I think it was just watching. <laughs> no, I think every, everyone, everyone down the pit, uh, down the pit lane. Um, no matter where they were start, like who they work for, or or what their experience of F one was, um, we all know that, uh, or at least thought we knew that if you don't complete over seventy five percent race distance, you don't get full points. Um, and then based on, I guess the letter, just the wording of the rules. Um, <laughs> F1 found a way to to just to just uh, bring up the insanity to another level. Um, so yeah, that we, that we unbelievably Max Verstappen winning the World Championship at Suzuka, um, which is it, it got a bit that, that it harkens back to an earlier time, uh, <laughs> you know, sort of the sort of late nineties, um, back when you could uh, well late nineties, early noughties when you could win at Suzuka, um, and obviously it wasn't the last race of the season this time, but uh, yeah, Max Verstappen being crowned World Champion under the most ridiculous of scenario. I mean, I, I, I feel for him in some ways because there's no way that he's like, he needs to win. He almost needs to win another championship just normally so that people don't think it's rigged. Um, so, but, but yeah, I think that it, it just sticks in my mind as just one of the, one of the ways that this season was just completely insane and, uh, and, and taught us to, you know, always read the rule book really. Um, it's almost like a law of unintended consequences um in in that way but yeah i think it's it it, it sort of it added sort of a, a weird level of excitement to a to a season that was at times um fairly monotonous um maybe not not in the way we expect yeah i promise i'm not ignoring aaron but um going back to tom um suzuka there was something that you wanted to say on this yeah, it's just around the whole sort of like points fiasco. Um, it was, uh, it was just it, what wasn't helped was the commentators presuming that we were going to get half points or quarter points or three quarter or you know, whatever based on based on when the um, uh, based on when the race ended. Um, at no point did it say that we weren't going to be getting full points and the wording of the regulations is pretty clear. Here we go again. Um, you know, it, it says that once, you know, basically the, the, the issue is that if you look at spa last year, um, this rule has come in because the race didn't start and then they did a few non laps and then awarded full points. That's where the farce is because we had done one lap or I think I think we did possibly three laps with one or two being under the safety car before we red flagged 
the race had started. So the race clock had started. That's why at that point it came into effect that we had full points. I still maintain that that isn't right and that it, it shouldn't matter. Like, you know, if you've done like the one or two laps, you then red flag for an hour, you then do two laps behind the safety car. And it's like, well, that's okay to award full points. But because you, but because you didn't do two laps in Spa last year, you don't get full points. It's like, I don't think that's not fair on the drivers. That's not fair on the teams. That's not fair on, on anybody. And it was also a bit of a bit of a joke because Max crossed the line thinking, all right, we go to next week. And then, you know, and then, and then thinking, you know, all oh, right, I need to do this to win it next week. Everybody was thinking that. And then next thing you know, Johnny Herbert, Comes over to him and says, Max has happened, world champion. We get a big banner across the bottom saying world champion. It was just a bit anticlimactic. And it was, and even taking the spectacle out of it, this is a wider issue with F1 is you've got so many rules and regulations. They're too complicated. They need to be simplified. And we've got things that contradict each other, which is obviously a big thing that we saw last year. Um, you know, we've got things that override each other, things that cancel each other out. And it's just like the rule book only almost needs to be ripped up and started again. And Suzuki is just another instance of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd be happy to talk about, you know, change like proposed changes later in the show, maybe like the F1 needs to make. But for now, let's actually talk a bit more about the teams in general throughout the season. And I'm going to start with Aaron. So Williams finished P10 disappointing for them after managing to scrape themselves off the bottom last season for the first time in a while and finish P8. Less points, more drivers. Ultimately, though, there was one big hindrance in Williams, wasn't there? Uh, well, are you talking about Nicholas Latifi or the FW44 itself? Because I mean, it was a difficult car to drive and you could see that Latifi was struggling and then it really didn't help that he kept throwing it, throwing it into the wall. But nonetheless, Alex Albon did a really good job in that car. And when it was able to shine, he was there taking the points. Although we, we shouldn't um, be too critical of Latifi because he did pick up uh, a ninth place in that shortened race in Japan. So, you know, we, we always see the best cars perform better in the wet because they produce more downforce. So on that weekend, the Williams was actually pretty good but overall the season a big disappointment because everyone I think hoped that um, Williams would make that step forward into the midfield but they didn't they they fell back and that that is the the problem with changing regulations you, you don't quite know where everyone's going to fall obviously the biggest example of that was 2009 where Braun who were out of business um returned and won the championship and Red Bull vaulted from the midfield to the front of the grid. You had the cars with 22 and 23 and 14 and 15 on the front two rows of the grid at times. So for Williams to fall down the order was, was a bit sad really, because we were hoping that Alex would get a chance to really shine. And he did from time to time, but he was held back by the car and it was at specific circuits that they performed. So Nick DeVries, when he subbed in for Albon, it came a good weekend because the, the Williams was good in a straight line, able to, to shed the drag really well. So he was able to pick up some points there. But ultimately, that they'll look at it as a, a year of a little bit of struggle, but also growth. Because remember, they are under new ownership. It was the first proper car that ownership had seen built and any changes they're putting in place. You know, we're seeing other teams build new factories and wind tunnels and whatnot. And it's taking time. As they say in football, trust the process. So this is going to be a long process for Williams. But, you know, th this is a team that could have gone, gone bust a year, a year and a half ago. So let's just be thankful that there's still this famous brand on the grid and Williams F1 is still here. Yeah, absolutely. And still here as Williams as well, I think, is a big thing. Because, you know, when you get new owners come in, names that have been on the grid for over a decade or even longer can just disappear, which we've seen um, in recent years. And we will see again this decade that's coming up, um, you know, with uh, Alfa Romeo, for example. 
But the other Alpha, Owain, Alpha Tauri, will also be disappointed that, you know, the changes between 2021 and 2022 just did not work for them. Ultimately, finishing P9 with 35 points. Last year, they had 142, which I think just shows that this year the car just was not right. But give me a bit of an overview of the Alpha Tauri season, Owain. Um, it's just been poor. I mean, it's been better, but it's just been poor. Um, and everyone else has made a step. Like it, they, they, I think they've, they, there have been fewer of the of the mistakes, particularly from Yuki Tsunoda um, through, from AlphaTauri this season. Um, it, you know, less of the of the issues that you saw, but uh, or that you would see. But I, I think the biggest thing is the reliability has been so. It's been so much worse. Um, you know, half, half the time this car is ending the race in the garage. Oh, well, not half the time, but a quarter of the time. Um, and the rest of the time, it's not putting in good results. I mean, their highest finish this year was was a couple of eighth places. Uh, yeah, it was a couple of eighth places. Oh, sorry, a fifth place in, in uh, Azerbaijan. And that's kind of a unique circuit. It doesn't really lend itself to to a, to any others on the calendar. Um, you know, the, the rest of it is... Uh, it, it doesn't make good reading. It's, it's not a good... <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, they've clearly. I don't think the car. I think the car's gone backwards. Um, I don't. Th- I think that their personnel have made better decisions, but the the car has been holding them back both in speed and in reliability. And that's one of those things that that's that is enough to drop you a hundred points now. Clearly, um, you know, they just never really got on top of what was happening. And I think it, you'd expect it with the with the backing that they have. Um, there was a cost cap and they had, you know, a decent amount of wind tunnel time. Um, you'd, you'd expect them to be able to sort of maximize that. And they just haven't, unfortunately. Um, I, you know, they're, they're only saving grace for Alpha is that they're, is that they're Red Bull backed. Um, so they, they have a, an awful lot of money to, to play with, uh, should it be granted to them. So they're not going to go away, but you know, it, it, it is kind of, it's difficult to develop your drivers when they're sitting in eighth, pl- uh, you know, eighth and di- sorry, ninth place in the championship, and you know that, that there's no one to fight. Almost, you know, there's 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 one team above, and even they had to had to fall quite far to be, be even even in the even in the realms of competing with Alfatori. Yeah, absolutely. And the team that did end up finishing P8, Tom Haas, who for them this is a big you know, jump because they have been objectively, you know, the worst car on the grid for the last few seasons. You know, the only reason really they finished ahead of Williams um, in 2020 was the fact that, you know, they just kept picking up points every now and then. Williams, you know, getting maybe, I think it was one. It could have been zero in 2020. Um, But in any event, they started off relatively strong this season, bringing in Kevin Magnussen after... Um, Mazepin was dropped for, you know, reasons going on in the world. Um, and everything looked to be going right with a car that was just not getting almost any development whatsoever. But ultimately, that is what let them down at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Hass, I think they were also let down by their power unit. Um, I mean, that Ferrari power unit at the start of the season was pretty... Well, I mean, it was probably the best on the grid. But then around Spain or whenever it was that Ferrari introduced those upgrades, any Ferrari power car was just going bang left, right and centre, whether it was Ferrari or it was Alfa Romeo or indeed Haas. Um, it cost Mick Schumacher points in Canada because his car had a failure um, coming through coming through the middle sector. Um you know, so how many times did 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 we see issues with with Ferrari power units this season, and you know, indeed, indeed, then the Haas. Granted, Haas weren't always on the pace. You know, there were quite a few times when they went out in Q one, and I think was it Australia they both went out in Q one, and it was a bit of a bump back down to to reality for them. Um, but also, nobody was expecting them to come into this season, and then blow everybody in the midfield away and they don't have the development budget of um, you know of some of the bigger teams even with the cost cap and with Red Bull breaching it um, you know so um, you know if I don't say it Aaron will um, <coughs> excuse me so sorry uh, yeah so 
ultimately, I think has this season was just about rebuilding, and by that I don't mean rebuilding Mick Schumacher's car every time you put it in the wall. Um, it was it was about rebuilding the team and his car, um, and just sort of flushing out the ghosts of Eurocali past, and you know, to getting to grips with the new regulations and and sort of just just beginning to make progress. In turn with that, there is obviously the driver decisions that they've made. However you feel about it, we'll talk about that in a bit, um, probably. You know, that has also, that decision has come around as of a, as of a result of this season. If you look to how they were at the start of the season, I would say eighth is a shame because at the start of the season, they really, really look good. Let's not forget they were battling with the Mercs on merit. And if you'd have told us that, this time last year, that Haas will be battling with the Mercs. I said it on one of the first shows, but unfortunately, that fell to you know nothing less. And then they they sort of dwindled into the midfield and got overtaken in development and pace by the Aston Martins. Um, even when Sol kept driving into people, um, so yeah, so Haas said they were they're a bit like Ferrari 2021 where they're sort of like showing glimpses of getting back to where they were after a really torrid year the year before. So they're, they're on the upward trajectory next year. I'd say they need to finish P6 in the constructors. So basically what you're saying as well, like 2021 Ferrari is that next season K Mag or Hulkenberg are both going to get maiden wins and, you know, maybe finish P2 in the championship. Um, but, you know, whilst we actually go back to not making bold predictions for 2022, 2023, in fact, that was 20, this year was 2022. Aaron, Aston Martin finished P7, tied on points with Alfa Romeo, but it's because Bottas got a P5 in Imola and Stroll and Vettel's best finishes were P6 in Singapore and Japan, respectively. Um, ultimately, P5, P7, sorry, um, where they finished last season, but they've got less points. They had, I think, one more driver than they did last time out. Or am I making things up? But in any event, um, tell me about Aston Martin's season. It was a bit of a scruffy season. It came good towards the end, really. But uh, the, the start of the year wasn't good for them. The car looks really nice. The livery, I mean, we all it was the livery we all hoped for when Aston Martin... Uh, we're coming into Formula 1, but last year we had that pink stripe on the car because of BWT, and then they disappeared off to Alpine and turned their cars pink. Um, and then we had the green bull. So they 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 know how to get people talking down there for one reason or another. Um, but unfortunately, it wasn't really because of the car being any good on track. The, the performance was really up and down. They, they got the P6 in Baku with... With Vettel, and of course, he had that spin where he missed the, the apex at turn three. I think he was dive bombing somebody and overshot. And in the end, that has come back to haunt them because had he got the P5 there, they might have gone to it. They would have had to go back uh, further on count back against Alfa Romeo. And I let me just double check. I don't think Alfa Romeo had quite as many P6s. So uh, two P6s for Alfa. So it would have come down to the total of P7s which I think, yeah, I think Alfa Romeo might still have taken it. So it would have given them a bit more of a chance. But nonetheless, Sebastian Vettel, in his farewell half season after announcing his retirement, drove beautifully. He was just, it was one of those, you know, when someone says they're going to stop doing something, and all of a sudden they fall back in love with it again. And it's almost like that, that child's sort of freedom of expression, that that youthful exuberance, and it all just comes back. And we saw that with Seb. All the jokes were back. He was fun. Not to say he wasn't fun before, but, you know, he was just loving life. He was relaxed. He was driving excellently. And at some point, you go, why is this guy retiring? Obviously, he's he's got a bigger purpose in this world, and let's hope he does some good things outside of Formula One. And they've got... They've got a tough man to please coming in <laughs> to replace him. If you're going to have a dodgy car next year, the last person you want in it is Fernando Alonso because you can hear it now. The radio messages, I mean, you thought the, 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 the relationship between Stroll and his old engineer was a bit on the short side at times. 
Alonso's not going to mince his words. If, if this thing isn't good, we're all going to know about it. So they, they've got they've got work to do at Silverstone. They really, really have. And Lawrence Stroll needs to give them the budget. Yeah, absolutely. And they need to remain within that budget as well, um, unlike some other teams that they have been allegedly copying this season. Um, but Owain, um, just as we mentioned, ahead of them, Alfa Romeo, level on points, um, started off really strongly, but it was bec- mostly because their car was just you know, underweight almost, giving them that extra bit of pace. Um, and Valtteri Bottas, you know, um, leading the team. Oh, yeah, um, by a huge margin. I mean, 49 points to six um, in, in favour of Valtteri Bottas. He had such a... It, it was, I mean, the experience showed. I mean, Grand Joe is obviously, you know, he's clearly a very good driver. He's in Formula One. Um, and they usually don't let someone too terrible in that car, but yeah, it's uh, I don't know it was you can see the drop off of uh, uh, where that pace goes away, um, you know, where the, where the other teams caught up. And and t- to be honest, there was it's I think it's you know, they it's just the consistency of results of Bottas, really. Um, despite that weird portion in the middle of the season where you know, from Austria onwards, he scored no points whatsoever. Um, until until they got to Mexico, but um, you know, I don't, it, it, it's been a it's been a poor run um, for, from the mid season onwards uh, for for the Alfa Romeo. Um, you know, I think half of it is probably caused by the fact that they've got a Ferrari power unit, but they're kind of locked in on that one. Um, beyond that, yeah, no, I think I, they, they need to do better. It's not been a great season. Um, yeah, they've scraped through uh, into. Uh, They've scraped through into that sixth place spot in the constructors uh, by the skin of their teeth, really. Um, but the, you know, there's the, they have to look at improving because there's 104 points between them and and the next team um, who are who are McLaren, and that's that that that's an, an insurmountably insurmountably large uh, uh, gap right now, uh, and they they need to come back stronger. Um, hopefully, Joe is a bit more experienced, but yeah, beyond that, it's it's going to be difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And jumping those 104 points, Tom, up to P5 McLaren, um, they are they did finish this season 120-ish points below the point total they had the previous season, which ultimately, you know, came down to a lack of the amount of podiums that, you know, Lando Norris was picking up. Danny Rick obviously got that win in Monza last season. But this season... You know, they started off poor, they had an over overheating breaks, but you know, what was the turning point? You know, how did they end up in P five? And tell me about this, you know, season long battle with Alpine they had. Well, I mean, they're only in the season long battle with Alpine on paper. Realistically, that was never gonna happen. They were never gonna win that. Um, the only way they can do that is if is if the Alpine's engine or electronics or turbo, whatever, um, went all French on us and went on strike, which he did a few times. However, thanks to um, a lack of ability and points on one side of the McLaren garage, um, the other side of the garage was dragging that car into places, or dragging the car in the constructors further up than than it than perhaps the performance of that car warranted. Um, and I'm sure people can figure out which drivers I mean. Um, they, yeah, just McLaren once were on such a good like trajectory from that seems to be my word of the, of the day today. Um, you know, it all started in 2019 when they got Lando and Carlos Sainz in the car, and they had those Renault engines because 2018 exposed some real weaknesses in the chassis because they spent far too long blaming that Honda power unit, and then they put the Renault engine in in 2018. They went, oh, hang on a minute. Um, so then 2019, they also got rid of Alonso and his toxicity, thank God. Um, you know, it's like just packs him back off to Alpine and then sending to Aston Martin. Can't wait for that. Um, it was uh, once, once they sort of got the chassis straightened out, and then they started the sort of whole team dynamic changed. You know, I think we were talking when we were playing it from the other day, um, that 
since since Ron Dennis left, a lot of things have changed in McLaren. They've become a lot more fun, a lot more sort of like approachable, not approachable, but sort of a lot more personable. Just just like one of the sort of more fun teams on the car on the on the on the grids, not on the calendar, um, as opposed to the as opposed to like the Ron Dennis era. I was reading this in Adrian Newey's book a few weeks ago, and the uh, uh, Ron Dennis nearly flipped this lid when Adrian Newey painted. He's off his blue. He's just like, why is it not grey? And the, and they're just you know just that was sort of that was sort of represented in the team. And now you know they got you know they got two good drivers. You know coming to this year they got two good drivers. I should say they've got a good team principal, a good CEO, a good core team around them. Um, they've got everything there to to be a good team. And they've got you know Lando is you know he's a very very good driver. Um, you know, you know, Piastri, you know, you don't win back to back F3 and F2 titles for nothing. Um, you know, so you know, he I'm expecting him to do big things, excuse me, in that car. So 2022 was a real downgrade for them. The car just looked it it just looked poor in the corners. It was just it, you know, it was it it looked like it just it it was just understeering into the corners and then just wasn't it just was just sort of like lethargic going out the corners, and it just that really got exposed on some circuits. And then, like you mentioned, they had the brake issues where the brakes were overheating, and they weren't able to get very good results. McLaren were the only team to get a podium outside the, the top three teams um, this year. Lando got a solitary podium in, I believe, Imola. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, well, thank you. I, uh, I couldn't remember exactly, but I thought it was. Um, if you compare it to how they were last year, where where Lando was, you know, you know he had you know, a good handful of podiums, and obviously the one two, and you know they were always in Q three and this and that. It's just, uh, it's just not what it was in that team. And I think um, the driver change that they've made is probably going to. Well, you would certainly hope is going to be good. Um, I mean, Piastri is a good name. I'm trying not to talk too much about the individual drivers. Um, it's uh, it's just uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm struggling out, running out of things to say for for McLaren really because it's just it was just a really really poor season by their standards, and it should have been better. It wasn't. They were lucky to finish where they did ultimately in 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 the constructors because they could have been a hell of a lot lower. Absolutely, and Aaron, a team who I am surprised ended up finishing P four, considering how many times we saw the cars literally on fire, even after races. You know, when it was just sat in Park Ferme, and you see flames, it's like it's it's happening again. It's Alpine in P four with one hundred and seventy three points somehow, though. Well, as, as long as it's not my blue French car being on fire, then I'll be very, very happy. Um, but the ones that Esteban Ocon and Fernando Alonso were given to use, uh, yes, they did regularly self-combust. And we even saw Ocon's car decide, I haven't failed in X amount of time. It's been too long. I need to spontaneously catch fire in Brazil. So to get around all of that, they actually had a very quick car. And at times they were just like a rocket ship on the straight. And Alonso delivered a, a front row grid slot in Canada. Let's not forget that. But then, obviously, he, he fell back down the order. And Al Alonso had a weird season. He, he was massively quick, pretty much everywhere, but somehow still managed to be beaten by his teammate. And they both had their fair share of reliability issues. Only Alonso kept feeling the need to shout about it all the time and you know, keep telling us I've lost a million points this year. And that was the greatest drive anyone's ever done in any car ever. And yet Ocon just kept his head down, did his thing and racked up the points, racked up some really good finishes. And he actually had the team's best finish of P4 in uh, Suzuka. Uh, so you can't say fairer than that. Ocon gets, I think, criticised a little bit because... He's not as spectacular as, say, a Gasly or an Alonso or a Russell or a Charles Leclerc. He just gets on with things. And I think people hold that against him a little bit, but he's shown he is absolutely the real deal. It's going to be all French in Alpine next year. I mean, that could go so many different ways. 
But for Alpine, that was a really good response to a drop down in form last year. And it gets them back to where they, they feel they should be. As a major constructor, they should be really minimum fourth because they are a essentially works team. Absolutely. And to follow back off the thing you were saying about Alcon, a lot of people I think as well are still a bit bitter about his unlapping move in Brazil a few years ago, which he had every right to make as far as I'm concerned. Um, but Wayne, moving on to, you know, Surprise P3, if we were con- if we were talking about this this time last season, you know, this was supposed to be the season where Mercedes snapped back at the injustices of Abu Dhabi 2021. Um, and, you know, the FIA admitted mistakes were made, Tom. Um, oh, Wayne, Mercedes in P3, you sort of touched on this in your memorable moments, but, you know, A, how did they end up here? But B, how impressive is it that after everything, they were only about 39 points off Ferrari in P2. <laughs> Bloody hard work, <laughs> I imagine. Um, yeah, no, it's... It, I, I, I kind of see Ferrari and Mercedes as a as a sort of... Not so much a tale of two cities, but like just a cautionary tale of what can happen. You know, you can have all the speed in the car in the world um, and you can just extract poor results from it time after time after time if it's unreliable or if you get the strategy wrong or if you don't um maintain the sort of relationships with your drivers and and the way that they have to operate um well enough i think mercedes have done for the most part i mean they've, some would say they've been a bit conservative on the strategy at times and that has cost them th- uh, that has cost them um you know potentially better results uh, but i think you know i think particularly zanvoort and places like that um would come to mind but apart from that you look at you look at the mercedes record and it's just it's unbelievable that they kept scoring i I said it before it's unbelievable they kept scoring podiums they just kept scoring podiums and and you know and, and just making um maybe not the most heroic decisions but kind of the correct decisions you know they've only got three retirements over the season one was a crash damage one was as a well one was uh obviously crash damage one was probably the result of crash damage uh with obviously lewis hamilton at spa and you know and then you had the um i think it was the what did you say it was the hydraulic uh, pressure problem for for lewis hamilton at abu dhabi and that was it you know th- you know we saw we regularly saw the the uh, the ferrari by comparison um breaking down or or setting on fire or doing any number of different things the mercedes didn't do that and and you know, i mean some other people did have reliability issues but they they you know the works team almost never did um you know they and they kept themselves out of trouble they, they like they, there were times where yeah they sort of rode their luck a bit but beyond that they just kept plugging away, kept scoring points, kept that team spirit, um, you know, and 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 showed what they're made of, and showed why they've won so many championships, why they've won, um, I believe it's eight on the spin uh, prior to this point. So it, it it's one of those things I expect them to come back stronger because if they're good, if they're this good with a bad car, who knows what they can? Well, we know what they can do with a great car. Yeah, and it will absolutely be interesting to see, you know, for tw- for the 2023 car, if they abandon this no pod concept or, you know, they double down and, you know, commit to it. Because ultimately, I think, you know, Brazil showed it can work. Um, they just have to figure out the parachute that's holding them back on straights in other circuits. But, Tom, let's move on to the parallel of Mercedes then, you know, kind of. A lot of the talking points are going to be the opposite of what Owain said about Mercedes, but Ferrari and P2, they promised so much and delivered a bit of a disappointing campaign, despite finishing P2. That sounds like my romantic life. Um, yeah, there was... Um, yeah, I mean, Ferrari this year, were just you know, they really started off on the front foot. You know, we really thought that, like hang on, we've got a good championship fight on our hands here. And when they came flying out the blocks in um, in Bahrain and then, you know, the Red Bulls had a double DNF, you know, because because I was I was watching back highlights, I forgot that Perez's rear axle locked itself on the last lap or something. 
and he got stranded at turn one. Um, it was just, you know, I just thought, I thought to myself, it was, I, I really thought to myself that we in Red Bull, we got our work cut out this year. You know, we thought we had it tough last year. It's going to be a big task this year. Um, thankfully, for, for me anyway, Ferrari, oh God, did I let to begin? Oh, I could be here all day talking about them and I apologise to any Ferrari fans for this. Um, but it's just, they're a team that just don't know how to win. You know, they um they just don't they don't have the calm head, they don't have the strategy, they don't have the racecraft, they don't have anything. They put the car on pole and then come Sunday, it's like it's like they they you know, they'll send the drive down, they'll be like, Okay, what now? And and the, they'll they'll look at someone and they'll go, Okay, they're doing that and it's not worked, so we'll do that. The biggest example by country mile was Hungary, pitting the Claire for hards. When you know we we was, we, we saw, you know, we we saw that, and it was just like, what are you doing? And then at, you know, at that point, the championship was done. Um, that's also you know that's 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 partly why I sort of take into to account what Aaron said about um, about letting the signs win over sort of gifting the Claire a win. I see why people will think that and and I and I get that thought process. But it's just oh man. Ferrari, they just imploded in spectacular style this season. You know, they they were lucky to get as many wins as they as they did in the end. So their their reliability, like I said, as soon as they introduced any upgrades was woeful. You know, that they were overheating, blowing up, breaking down. Left, right, and center. The driver's decent, you know. You know, you know, the Claire obviously comes with a hell of a lot of pedigree, you know, GP3 and F2 champion. Um, and you know, you know, Sainz is a good driver, you know, he's come to the Red Bull Academy, and then he spent time at um, Renault and then McLaren, and now he's at Ferrari, emulating his idol Fernando Alonso, actually. Um, but if Ferrari wants to mount a proper championship battle. They need to rip out all the dead wood and they need to have someone running that team who knows how to run a team. But not so was not that person. He was a good technical director. He was never a good race principal or a team principal. And they need someone who can handle all elements of it. And that's why people like Toto Wolf and Horner and Andreas Seidel are so good at what they do, is because they know how to control well not so much control but they know how to manage all these different elements and they have good people around them who they trust so ferrari need to do that they need to you know they need to go back to the drawing board they need to restructure you know get new personnel whatever um because they've got the facilities they've got the they had the car this year they did and then they just forgot how to win and then they they started doubting themselves, they got on the back foot, and then Red Bull just seized their opportunity and just sailed off into an unbeatable lead in both championships. And Ferrari went from looking like they could possibly win both championships to just holding on to P2 in both championships. So, you know, it's just, yeah, what... You know, you know, as Fernando was said, it's it's a joke. Yeah, it was very much, and like you say, ultimately both for both championships coming down to P two on the last race. You know, it's it's not what Ferrari wanted, and ultimately, you know, it's led to such a golfing class. Aaron, you know, Red Bull ultimately, you know, were the team to be in every single weekend this season. Um, after they solved their initial reliability problems. Yeah, they, they didn't have it all their own way. And regardless of what you think of Red Bull as a racing team, of certain individuals within that team, they did the best job. They have a genius in Adrian Newey. And this championship is all down to him. Because if that car was less good, I think Ferrari are in with a shout and you've got a driver in Charles Leclerc who can really give Max Verstappen a run for his money. We've seen George Russell is prepared to get his elbows out and defend against Max. 
And obviously we know the whole dynamic between Max and Lewis. They love to tango, don't they? they those two should just get onto Strictly and, you know, be done with it. So they had such an advantage because Adrian Newey developed such a good car. And th- th- this is a bloke who did his, uh, his thesis for university on ground effect. So we should not be surprised that he built a near rocket ship uh, when we switch back to ground effect. And of course, you've got a driver like Max Verstappen. Of course, he's going to split opinion in the same way that Michael Schumacher did and Fernando Alonso does uh, uh, still to this day in some of the things he says and some of the way he does things. But on the track, he is exceptional. He is a first class operator and he's only getting better. That is the scary thing. All of this winning, he's just, you, you look at these, these performers, you look at like Roger Federer, it, the, the tennis legend, he learned how to win and he just developed this winning habit. Winning is a habit. And you see people who have been super successful, they almost don't know how to deal with not winning. And it, it does chew them up inside when they don't. And of course, you've got a perfect foil for Max in Perez, who did his job perfectly this year in that he won when Max couldn't on most occasions. And there wasn't many occasions where Max <laughs> couldn't win because you could put him, you know, a week behind. He'd still catch up and, and win the race, especially in Spa. So Red Bull have just done a fantastic job. And they, they haven't had the competition, especially in the second half of the season. It has been much easier for them. And honestly, I think a season without that sort of aggro is probably good for everybody after 2021 but you know they still left themselves with a few questions because uh obviously their their junior driver yuri vips was involved in a bit of a a scandal and they didn't really do very much about it so there's a few question marks over that but on their on on their on track exploits first class and absolutely worthy double world champions yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like you pointed out, Max Verstappen, no matter where he started a race, you know, you would expect him to be on that top step. You know, Hungary spins around in the race, finishes first, followed that up, you know, with Spa starting P14, gets into P1, you know. And I think an element of it did come down to the fact that so many people just didn't race against him ultimately. You know, it was they it wasn't their race. But then the problem was the only people who were racing him were, um, you know, in the same team ultimately. And he wasn't ultimately racing him, you know. After Monaco, it became, you know, right, focus on one driver ultimately. But, um, you know, I think an element of this has to come down to, you know, how we're going to decide ultimately who the team of the season was. Red Bull? I think would be a very legitimate, you know, um, operation. I think there could be arguments for Mercedes, maybe not as the team of the season, but to be in that contention. Um, and then, you know, you've just got to look at teams like Haas making the relative jump um, and all of that. But Wayne, let's start with you, your team of the season, please. Yeah, you say it's a, for me, it's a no brainer almost. It's, it, it's got to be Red Bull. Like there's, there's, you know, they, they blew everyone else away. Uh, you know, they, they finally, it took them a long, long while, but they got their mojo back. Um, you know, they really did they, just astoundingly well. I mean, yeah, they had the the issues with driver management, but let's be honest, they've had those for years. Um, it was one time. It was one or two times that that fla- fla- flared up. The rest of the time, it, it, it's an astounding record. I mean, there, there were, there's two occasions yeah, two occasions where they weren't um, on the top two step of the podium. And that's about it. I mean, it's 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 ridiculous um, how how quickly. Uh, how, sorry, how often they did that. Um, they built a brilliant car. They executed the strategy well. The drivers did their jobs perfectly. I mean, it's just it, it, it's one of those things. It, it as much as it hurts. Um, I'm not a massive fan of Red Bull for various reasons, but it, it's you have to sit there back at, at the end of the day and just go, it's a joy to watch. Um, someone like you know, the, the people working so hard and so well, um, and, and in the end, it got them the results. 
It did indeed. Tom, are you following the trend? Was Red Bull the team of the season for 2022? I mean, my opinion is probably going to be slightly biased, but yes, it, it was. Um, yeah, they just stormed off with, with the championships and it's Adrian Newey's most successful ever car. They were aided by the fact that they've now got a good power unit in the back, you know, after some turbulent times with Renault and then, you know, Honda finding their feet. And now it's just that whole package. Yeah. It's hard, hard to ignore. Uh, I do want to say, you probably could, not going to be expecting this, a special mention to Mercedes for turning their season around and also Aston Martin for turning their season around. Because Aston looked dead and buried at one point and they turned it around and they've come P6 um, or P7, wherever they are. Um, Bern and Manda started the head of the season. Both teams did really, really well to finish where they finished. Yeah, absolutely. And Aaron, coming to you to wrap it up, Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari, Alpine, McLaren, or is it just Red Bull? Well, you can't deny that Red Bull certainly did the best job, but I'm actually going to give my team of the season to a team that thoroughly outperformed my own expectations of them, and that was Alfa Romeo. Look, they've been pretty bang average the last few years with uh, Kimi Raikkonen and Antonio Giovinazzi there. You've got Raikkonen, who was, you know, on his day, he could still produce it, but, you know, they didn't really have very many of them, and the car wasn't brilliant, and Giovinazzi was kind of only there because of the Ferrari connections. This year, they've got a revitalised Valtteri Bottas and a rookie in Zhou Guan Yu. And look, the points they've racked up don't really show how well they performed, especially for Joe. He only got six points over the whole season, but he was in a couple of really good positions. And also we should just be very thankful that he's still alive after the accident he had at Silverstone. So for Alfa Romeo to outperform teams such as Aston Martin with arguably bigger budgets uh, and jump above Alfa Tauri, that's quite significant because it obviously means they get more budget next year, the, the, obviously the prize money from this year. And it just means that this is, this is a famous team in Sauber that has competed in sports car racing, has competed for a long time in Formula One, almost as long as I've actually been alive. That's how long they've been in Formula One. So this is a famous team and they should be you know there and we should be looking after them and praising when they do a good job because they... They have done an excellent job this year to sort of rebuild some almost respectability within that, 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 that camp. Absolutely. And like you say, you know, previous seasons, Raikkonen had mentally checked out of Formula One a long time ago. Um, and Giovinazzi probably shouldn't have been in Formula One for as long as he was. Um, but yeah, let's move on to our drivers of the season. Owain. Who's your contender? Um, I could take the easy option and just say Max Verstappen, um, but I think someone else will take that, so that's all good. Uh, it's not. It's not like he's going to have a. a, 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 a he's going to be wanting for people to sing his praises, but um, I, th- I think I'm going to have to go with. Oh, I don't know. I think probably George Russell. Um, I think you know, obviously his talent's been good. Um, but he he is <laughs> whether you like him or not, he's the guy who's brought Mercedes back to their winning ways. Um, you know, it, it's been difficult. Um, but he's all he's always been willing to sort of push as hard as possible and 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 make you know and sometimes make those those calls that maybe don't work out half the time. Where you know, what strategy wise, I think it's um it's a difficult thing to do that to come into a big team and 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 demand that of them. Um, but it's uh. It's something that he's he's gone on and done. Um, I think he's just sort of obviously he's been part of the DNA and he's been gradually getting into the DNA that team DNA of that team for a, for a long while. Similar to a, to another British driver I might know, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's uh, it seems like um, he's he's really adjusted well to being full time in a top team, um, where we've seen some other drivers not adjust so well uh, throughout throughout the year. So I think he's done a great job, um, and and long may it continue. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a, a, a well-deserved, you know, potential driver of the season amongst several people. Tom, your driver of the season, please. Obviously, it's, you know, Daniel Ricciardo, right? 
no, hell, hell yeah. Um, yeah, he, he and the TV just mwah, for me this season. Um, no, um, it's hard to look past Max this season, and I know people go, mm, TV. yeah, but you know, he won 15 races, and you know, just it's not even that he was put on pole and then lead away, it's you know, the, the Hungary win, the Italy win, the Spa win, um, those kind of drives and then you know you know to to pull out a 30 second gap or 20 second gap like he did in Suzuka um you know just that kind of driving in the wet um yeah it has to be Hamilton uh sorry no it has to be Max for, for yeah it does what? it has to be Hamilton <laughs> no no it really doesn't he was awful this year um couldn't even win a race um, yeah, no, yeah, no, it, yeah, it has been Max, but I want to give a special mention to Kevin Magnuson, um, for doing bits in that house this season. Um, you know, it's nice, nice to see him back, and then you know, obviously, good, good return in Bahrain, and you know, some of the good results, you know, obviously, the pole in Brazil, blah blah blah. It wasn't perfect by any stretch, um, but yeah, made Mick Schumer made Mick look distinctly average, um. So yeah, I'm gonna say Max, but special special mention to K Mag. Max, but special mention to K Mag, absolutely. Aaron, your driver of the season, please. Lando Norris. He was excellent. You know that that McLaren wasn't consistent at all. He even admitted to having to drive outside of his own comfort style, and that's kind of what tripped Daniel Ricciardo up. And I was just looking at the the results across the board and. Look, Lando did a supreme job. He got that podium in Imola, and I think he got a total of 16 points finishes. And Ricardo did okay. There was a smattering of points. And if you look at it as a mid-table team, you know, that's kind of what you'd expect, a driver really doing well, progressing, and someone else sort of backing up. But obviously the expectation for McLaren is potential race wins. And La- Lando is... Similar to George, he's ju- he just needs that one moment where everything comes together. Maybe he needs to move teams, but obviously he's put his faith in McLaren and they've put their faith in him and they are at the moment a match made in heaven. He, he loved finishing in P7, but that was regularly best of the rest. There was a few P6s, there was some P5s, there was the P4 in Singapore and of course the, the uh, Imola podium. Just so much consistency. You know, there's only three occasions where he finished the race and finished outside the points. And they were also weekends where Daniel Ricciardo didn't score points either. So, you know, it just shows you the level that Lando is driving at. He's still only like eight years old or something, isn't he? He, he looks so young. He is young. You know, there's barely facial hair on his chin. You know, he's going to be in Formula One for forever by the look of it so he's you know he, mclaren give him a winning car and he can win because i think that's something we'd all love to see yeah and also maybe you know enforce that he comes into the pits if it is hammering it down in you know a circuit that he's winning at um but on that note let's move on to race of the season now there's definitely a few contenders there's a few races that absolutely were not contenders um but i'm just going to start things off with silverstone you know it was there was a four way fight for the um win amongst three different teams it was the first occasion really where we saw mercedes with a chance of winning a race um, and ultimately, I think without a safety car, it, it might have happened, um, you know, and we obviously got the through goes Hamilton, which, you know, would be it's definitely a memorable moment. Um, and it's probably going to be clipped um, forever from, you know, the Sky team for, you know, their little packages. But that's just because, you know, it's a Sky commentator doing it. But oh, Wayne, I'm going to move on to you. What was your race of the season, please? I was going to say Silverstone. You um, still can. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to now. <laughs> no, I think it was, oh, you know, I, um, I'm going to go with Zandvoort because that was fun. That was fun to watch that one. I don't remember too much when about it. When you could it. see I, through the flyers, you mean? Yeah, well, of course. Yeah, no, I just I just remembered. I just remembered it. I just remembered enjoying myself while watching it. 
Um, that was a fun time. I think, again, without a safety car, maybe maybe the Mercedes could have won it that time. Uh, it was it was a, sort of one of the last circuits where it, uh, where it definitely suited their car. They were, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd have loved to have seen a win earlier than it came. But yeah, I think they did a great job. And, and uh, yeah, I just enjoyed the race. Yeah, so we've got one for Silverstone, one for Zandvoort. Tom Downey, your race of the season, please. Uh, I'm going to say Silverstone. Um, I mentioned it earlier when I was talking about signs. Yeah, uh, that that's that's it for me. That was race of the season. Closely followed by Brazil. Yeah, and Aaron? Uh, Brazil is the obvious choice, and Brazil probably was the best race of the season, but I'm going to say for the, the tension and almost that unexpected excitement, America. So you had Hamilton longing out the strategy and Verstappen hunting him down. We all knew that once Verstappen got DRS, it was all over. But there was that, does Hamilton have quite enough? There was always that jeopardy. That was the most, of that run of victories that Red Bull had, that was the most difficult one for them to win. And only Lewis Hamilton in a Mercedes could have made it as difficult as they did. So there was just that, that question mark over it all the way through that tension and that even if Verstappen won every race of the season, if all of them were like that and they were tense and, you know, it was difficult, I don't think we'd have many complaints. The problem comes when they're all too easy. And you, you can say that about the Mercedes dominance, the Ferrari dominance, the old Red Bull dominance, but when they're really challenged and something's put in their way, that makes it even more uh, enjoyable. Even if, your team and driver comes out on the wrong side of it as it did uh, for me on that occasion. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we want to see teams fighting for wins. We don't want to see them putting it on pole, disappearing and finishing the race, you know, 30 seconds ahead of P2. Um, even if P2 just happens to be the driver's teammate as well, you know, you know, equal machinery, you're showing your weaknesses there. But um, on that note, um, other than obviously saying a goodbye to Vettel, Ricardo, Latifi and Schumacher for 2022 um, and welcoming in De Vries, um, Piastri and I've forgotten who else is coming in. To- Logan Sargent. Thank you. Um, and also back. welcoming. Back. I say welcoming back, you know, time will tell us whether it's the right decision. But, you know, I think it's a divisive um, decision on it. But welcoming back Hulkenberg um, for 2023. Um, but on, you know, t- uh, it's time to give an opportunity to um, give some promo. So um, obviously, Owen, you're from Grid Talk, as is Tom Downey. But, you know, if anyone wants to find you online other than here, where can they? I don't think you can. I can't I can't in good conscience direct people to Twitter <laughs> at this point. Um, shall I make a Bebo account and then, uh, and then we'll do it that way? I mean, you can do. I wouldn't. Please don't. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, I really can't in conscious send people to Twitter right now. It's fun. It's fun to watch something from it explode from the inside. But I, I beyond that, um, you know what? If if you really do, if you really hate yourself and you just want to stick it to Elon Musk and make their server cost a little bit higher, uh, just come and find me at Owen Medford. Yeah, and Tom, if anyone wants to find you online. Where can they go? Uh, nowhere really. I don't. I don't. Other than great here. talk. Yeah, <laughs> other than great talk. Yeah, um, yeah. I I don't. Yeah, um, I have Facebook. I don't use it. My Instagram's private. I don't have Twitter. Yeah, that's about it. I'm too old for TikTok. Um, and I probably haven't heard of any of the others. So yeah. Just hope you never show up uh, against Tom's team in a in a war zone tournament. That's all I'll say. Oh, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll stomp the absolute living daylights out of you. <laughs> Challenge is being laid down. Aaron, five red lights. You know, where can people find that? I, I am magic. M- m- anyway, this is unbelievable for this show. I am on uh, Twitter and you can find me online. Um, so you can find me at five underscore red underscore lights. You can find me at Aaron Harper 41. So they're two separate accounts. Uh, you can find my YouTube channel, which is the five red lights F1 podcast. 
I'm in the middle of releasing and editing uh, every team's season wrapped up in a 60 second video. So as a YouTube short. So uh, look out for those. The Ferrari one went out today and is already, hang on, let's have a look at the live stats. We are, let's refresh the page. Need a drum roll. 1.3 thousand views. So thanks for everyone who has already watched that. Uh, You can find me in lots of different places, as I've already mentioned. So yeah, the podcast is available, YouTube, Spreaker, Apple, Spotify, you know, where you find your podcasts. Yeah. And if anyone wants to find me outside of Grid Talk, I am on the socials at Rubes, add a 001 if you're on Instagram and you're looking for me. Um, You know, eventually someone will give up that account and I will get, you know, the consistency across them all. But for now, I'll just settle for adding 001 on the end. But on that note, Grid Talk is available on YouTube where most episodes are recorded live, as well as Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, Omni Studio, and Pocket Casts. Just search Formula Grid Talk for our back catalogue of shows with previews and reactions to qualifying and the race results. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get mics, lights, and better recording equipment. You can get your hands on some official Grid Talk merchandise on f1chronicle.com forward slash store. And also make sure you subscribe to the first to know when each new episode is released. We'll be back soon with plenty more F1 content. But for now, that was the season. Thank you very much for listening across the entire year. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. Thanks for having us. As you say, no problem. Cheers, Rubes. As always. And on that note, goodbye.